In the winter of 1917-18, trains carrying thousands of armed factory workers went south from the great cities of Moscow and Petrograd to the very edge of Russia. Most of these passengers were in civilian clothes, others in olive khaki army gear that had known Galician mud and German shrapnel. The closest thing to a common uniform was the red armband they all wore. Some wore a metal cap badge in the shape of a red star. Some were the hammer and plow device. The hammer and sickle, which would become the symbol of communism in the 20th century, had not yet caught on. The red star was, for some reason, worn upside down. They wore ammunition belts crisscrossed over their chests. Bullets were scarce and they wanted to keep them jealously in arm's reach. These were the Red Guards, the closest thing the revolution had to an army. And they were going to the country of the Don Cossacks and into battle. This is Revolution Under Siege, a podcast about the Russian Civil War. This is a podcast from the 1919 Review, a blog on history and culture. For the text version of this episode, look us up at 1919review.wordpress.com. One observer recalls the aspect of the Red Guards in these early months. They still had a poor command at a rifle and there was nothing to say about the bearing of a soldier. But on the other hand, fire sparkled in everyone's eyes. Everyone was full of courage. Another source describes the red column under the former Tsarist officer, Muraviev. Quote, they were oddly dressed, totally undisciplined people, covered from head to toe with every kind of weapon, from rifles to sabres to handguns and grenades. Arguments and fights constantly flared up among their commanders. End quote. These commanders were elected by the rank and file. Some of them were sergeants and corporals of the old army. Others were members of the radical left parties, the left socialist revolutionaries and the Bolsheviks. Key decisions were taken at mass meetings. And of course, some of them, like Moraviev and others, were former Tsarist officers who had agreed to serve the revolution. The Red Guards, rising from the slums and shop floors, were going south to fight an army that was their opposite in every way. A force called the Volunteer Army, three or four thousand strong, had gathered by the Don River for one purpose, to crush the October Revolution. It was made up almost entirely of officers and cadets. Over one in five of these men were members of the hereditary nobility, who made up only 1.3% of the population at the time. They were known by a nickname that was just a few weeks old, the White Guards. The Red Army as such did not yet exist, and the Volunteers were only the first and the smallest of the White Armies. But this campaign in the Cossack lands at the start of 1918 was like a microcosm of the whole Civil War. We're going to look at the origin of the Red Guards, at how these armed factory workers ended up travelling far from home to fight the officers and Cossacks. Next, Post, we're going to examine the origin of the White Guards and also take a brief look at the Cossacks before telling the story of what happened when these two forces, Red and White, met. The Reds. We will begin by looking at three revolutionaries. Taken together, they provide a portrait of the Red Guards and of the revolutionary milieu. Clement Voroshilov was typical of the Red Guards. His dad was a railway worker. He began his working life at age seven as a miner, then as a farm laborer under a kulak, a wealthy peasant, then as a shepherd. All this before age 12, 
when he got a place in a village school. But by age 15 his education was over and he was toiling again, this time in a metalworks. At 17 he was under arrest for participating in a strike. In 1903, as a metal worker in the Hartmann factory in Lugansk, eastern Ukraine, he came into contact with socialists. By 1918 he was a well-known workers' leader in the Donbass region. Vasily Chuikov was the eighth of twelve children of a peasant family. His mother a devout Christian on the staff at a local church, his father a bare-knuckle boxer. Chuikov finished his education at the age of twelve and moved to St. Petersburg, where he worked in a factory that made spurs for cavalry officers. We will have occasion to check in again on Vasily Chuikov before the end of this episode. The third individual we're going to look at is Maria Spiridonova. She came from a well-off family. In 1906, she was enraged by the violence and sadism of a local official, so she walked up to him one day and shot him dead. Police and Cossacks arrested her immediately. There followed a notorious case which made headlines around the world. Spiridonova suffered torture, sexual assault, and finally a sentence of death commuted to life imprisonment. But with the revolution of 1917, as we're going to see, came amnesty, and Spiridonova emerged from prison and emerged as the leader of the Left Socialist Revolutionary Party. While these individuals are by no means the main characters of the narrative that's going to emerge uh, in the next number of episodes, they will feature again from time to time. But as I say, the main purpose in talking about them is to give an introduction to the Red Guards. In Western Europe, the working class was made up by and large of the children of artisans. By contrast, the workers of Russia were the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of serfs. As late as 1917, a staggering number of them still owned land in some distant village. There were men and women of a range of different nationalities and religions. There were settled established workers and recent migrants from the village. There were the workers of St. Petersburg, where gigantic metal and textile works employed thousands or tens of thousands, and there were the smaller workshops of the other cities. Even on the eve of revolution, most workers still contributed their kopecks to buy oil for the religious icon lamps that they kept in the corners of their workplaces. The greatest concentration of workers was in St. Petersburg. This city was later called Petrograd, then Leningrad. Working class people lived three, four or five to a single room apartment or to a cellar, paying really high rents for these squalid surroundings. Workers on different shifts would share a single bunk. Outside St. Petersburg, it was common to sleep in a company-owned barracks. Shifts were 10, 11, 12 hours. Overcrowding and overwork constituted mass and merciless social violence. 100,000 people died in a cholera ed epidemic in 1900. One in four children died before they were a year old. Even on low pay and long hours and in squalid surroundings, modern city life held out a promise of a better life. Workers consumed the daily newspapers and the illustrated periodicals with their ads and sensational stories. They read fiction about detectives and explorers and romance. Sherlock Holmes remained of enduring popularity throughout early 20th century Russia. Single working women spent one-fifth of their income on clothing, often employing seamstresses to copy fashionable styles. The young male metal worker, meanwhile, unless the strains of working life drove him into the trap of vodka addiction, would save up for a smart suit, a watch, a straw hat, and go out walking on a Sunday afternoon. Many would have preferred city life to the patriarchy, the drudgery, the poverty, the squalor, and the narrow horizons of the semi-medieval Russian village. Meanwhile, there were, of course, political parties which offered solutions to the desperate conditions in which workers lived. First, there were the Social Democrats, a Marxist party which split into the moderate, loosely organized Mensheviks and the militant, tight-knit Bolsheviks. This split began in 1903 and culminated in 1912. Others looked to the peasant majority instead of to the workers or were inclined to a more romantic rather than a scientific outlook. These would join the Socialist Revolutionaries, the SRs, a broad party with roots in the terrorist movement of the 19th century. There were also Tolstoyans and anarchists and a range of other left groups. 
three quarters of people in the Russian Empire were illiterate, but a majority of workers could certainly read in the smoke and grime of factory and mining districts or in the noise and disorder of overcrowded housing, they would tackle the dense legion of words printed on tin paper under titles like Iskra, The Spark, Novaya Jin, New Life, and Raboche Dielo, The Workers' Cause. And this is a good occasion to make my usual apology for mispronouncing Slavic names and words. After political meetings, meditating on what they had learned, or on whatever fierce controversy had been aired, they would walk home along the unpaved, barely lit streets of the working class districts. In winter, this would mean trudging in darkness through a river of mud. There's an anecdote that's told about this period, that the police, if they had reason to believe that a young man was a member of the Social Democrats, would arrest him, and then play a simple trick that played on the psychology of party loyalty. Quote, a prisoner's mother, for example, would call on the colonel of gendarmerie, police chief, and ask to be allowed a meeting with her son. Well, you know, your son is accused of belonging to the Socialist Revolutionary Party, the gendarme would say to her in a categorical tone. Oh, come, colonel, the mother would reply in amazement. My son has always been a convinced social democrat. The gendarme would rub his hands with glee. That was all he needed. While it's a funny story, it's also like a reminder that this was a brutal police state that would lock up people just for their political convictions. Social Democrat and Socialist Revolutionary alike were risking imprisonment, exile, even the possibility of death. They were willing to risk it because what was said in those meetings and what was printed on that cheap paper struck a chord with their own experiences and offered a way forward. You know, it's no crime to be poor. Mm. In this world it is the rich who are the criminals. Someday their wealth will be ours. Oh, that would be nice. If they would agree, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> and who will make this miracle to come to pass? People. Ordinary people. Like you? Like me. Thoughts along these lines must have run through the head of the socialist worker as they negotiated the mud and open cesspits of the unlit streets. They must have wondered whether the working class could really defeat the might of the whole authoritarian system. Whether the toiling people could really run and govern a country whether they should just give up on the struggle and accept their lot in life. But in the year 1905, that struggle heated up. <music> 1905 was a year of revolution. The workers of 50 towns and cities established councils directly elected from each workplace. These workers' councils were known as Soviets. In places, they became parallel revolutionary governments. Workers formed defense groups to protect the Soviets, and these groups became known as the Red Guards, red being the traditional color of revolution. But this first iteration of the Red Guards was short-lived. The army stayed loyal to the Tsar. 100,000 Cossacks were mobilized to crush the revolution by a charter that confirmed all their privileges. The wealthy liberals supported the revolution at first, but by the end of the year, they were frightened and weary and they met the Tsar a lot less ha than halfway. There were many disorders in the countryside, but by and large the cities were isolated. The Tsarist government hanged 3,000 revolutionaries and killed as many and more again, many more again in fact, in various pogroms and repressions. There was street fighting in Łódź and Moscow. The Polish and Russian Red Guards fought bravely for the same cause, but it wasn't enough to overcome a professional army. Years of reaction followed. There were 410,000 members of state-sponsored ultra-right-wing organizations and they were on a rampage. Jewish people in particular were targeted for arson, looting and massacres. Millions fled to Western Europe or North America. It was in this context that the above-mentioned Maria Spiridonova shot dead a Tsarist official. The revolutionary parties were in this period beaten down and disarmed and racked with internal division. The Bolsheviks and Mensheviks made their split final. The SRs divided into left and right. However, they remained in one party. Their subsequent painful history, as we'll see in coming episodes, proves that there are worse things in political life than splits, but we'll get to that. At the same time, Tsarism had been forced to make some concessions to political democracy and trade union rights and these were utilized to the full by the parties. 
The 1905 revolution had filled out abstract theory with concrete experience. The Soviets showed how the workers could form their own alternative government, their own participatory democracy, their own councils. On the other hand, the Red Guards had been no match whatsoever for the army. Could the insurgent people wage a successful civil war? Or would the next revolution also be drowned in blood? Before that question could be answered, a different kind of war broke out. In bourgeois terms, it was a war between the Allies and Germany. In Bolshevik terms, it was a war between the Allied and German upper classes. And which of them won was a matter of indifference. The party looked to the conscript peasants, most of them wearing their first good pair of boots. When the boots wore out, they'd be ready to listen. The ones who got back home at the price of an arm or an eye or a leg, these were the lucky ones. Even Comrade Lenin underestimated both the anguish of that 900 mile long front and our cursed capacity for suffering. By the second winter of the war, the boots had worn out. But the line still held. Their greatcoats fell to pieces on their backs. Their rations were irregular, led by men they didn't trust. Come on, you bastards! The First World War began in the summer of 1914. The horrors of modern warfare, machine guns and apocalyptic artillery bombardments were compounded by all the worst kinds of waste, incompetence, shortages and harsh discipline. The worker drafted into the army or navy found himself under an autocrat, worse than the factory boss, maybe even worse than the Tsar. That is, the typical Russian officer who was entitled to punch a soldier in the face to humiliate him publicly if he met him off duty, to spit on him. The Tsar's regime was vicious both in defeat, for example over a million people were banished from the borderlands as the Germans advanced, and in victory. For example, a repressive anti-Semitic regime was installed in the cities that they conquered from Austria. The first tremor of revolution came not in the cities, but in Central Asia which was at the time colonized by Russians. An attempt to impose conscription in 1916 triggered a rebellion. The army went in, killed 88,000 rebels and civilians and sent two and a half million people fleeing into China. That's 20% of the population of Central Asia. Now, in the big cities of European Russia, events in Central Asia were not at the forefront of the minds of working class people. They were distracted by the food crisis. The burden of feeding the army had made an absolute mess of the food supply system and the price of bread kept rising. At first the war produced an atmosphere of patriotism that smothered all dissent. The Bolshevik party, riding high in 1912-14, to had been reduced to 12,000 members by 1917. That's 12,000 members in a country with hundreds of millions of people. Nobody expected the revolution of February 1917. Women workers in Petrograd triggered a decisive battle which drew in the whole class and raged for five days. Each night the insurgent people would retire across the bridges to the working class suburbs. Each morning hundreds of thousands marched out again and resumed the struggle. They had few weapons so they used stones and even sheets of ice. In Petrograd a general strike exploded into riots as a starving population defied the police and the military in search of food. But the Tsar's government could no longer rely upon the troops of the imperial garrison. And as the soldiers began to fraternize, it became clear that the revolution was imminent. Regiment by regiment, the soldiers of the garrison joined the revolution. 
This mutiny was decisive. The Tsar abdicated his throne and was imprisoned. The key leaders of this movement on the ground were the members of local committees of the various socialist parties, the workers who had trudged home after meetings and poured over Iskra, sitting on their shared bunks in their overcrowded flats and cellars. They had torn down a 300-year-old dynasty in five days. The power vacuum was filled by elements of the old regime and its tame opposition. They formed a self-appointed provisional government, and most people were inclined to give them at least a chance. At the same time, the Soviets, the Great Workers' Councils of 1905, re-emerged. They spread from Petrograd to every city, and even to the regiments and villages, forming a brilliant system of participatory democracy, which was kind of rough and ready, and it didn't yet embrace the entire population. But it was sensitive to the moods of the masses, and it reflected the popular will at every turn. The delegates were subject to recall and re-election. So in this honeymoon period of the February Revolution, the socialist revolutionaries and the Mensheviks had a decisive majority in the Soviet. Both supported the provisional government, and many of the Bolsheviks on the spot did as well. So hopes ran high at first, there was a mood of euphoria and national unity, but months passed and the mood hardened. The contradictions within Russian society, the question of the land that is, the landlords versus the peasants for possession of the land. The question of the workers in the cities, who were under exploitation in the factories and misery at home, and who now had their misery exacerbated by food shortages. The key contradictions between the national minorities and the central state of Russia. These contradictions were not solved, but on the contrary sharpened. And on top of it all, you had the immense pressure of the war. The provisional government proved that it was determined to continue the war. It persecuted those peasants who dared to touch the property of the wealthy landowners. The food situation got worse, and over the summer the economy fell decisively into crisis. From April on, uh, Lenin, the Bolshevik leader, returned from exile, and the Bolsheviks put forward a tough and clear position, calling for the overthrow of the provisional government, and for a socialist revolution. And here's Lenin in, of all things, the Indiana Jones TV series, making a speech. Comrades, a question! How many more of your young men must die in this war before the capitalists who started it are satisfied? Before they have enough profit from building the tanks, the guns, the shells. How many? 50,000, a million, two million. I say none, I say stop the war now. <laughs> Our demands are simple. We want peace for the soldier. We want bread for our workers. We want land for our peasants. No! But that is only the beginning. When we come to power, we will utterly change this nation into something the world has never seen before. Under communism, Russia will be governed by the people. In one great armed militia, ordinary people running their everyday affairs themselves. The dictatorship of the proletariat. This will develop into a society so perfect that the state itself will wither away. What? Kerensky and the provisional government offer instead capitalism with lighter chains for the workers. <laughs> there can be no compromise with these frauds. Peace, bread, land. Keep on saying it until all Russia rises up to demand it, and then, then. We will lead the proletariat to victory!
the membership of the Bolsheviks rocketed from 12,000 to 350,000. In September, they won a decisive majority in the Soviet. What had changed since 1905? This time, as well as a workers' movement, there was a mass movement of the rural toilers who were not waiting for any decree from on high, they were sweeping the countryside, seizing the estates of the nobility. Meanwhile, the army which had crushed the revolution in 1905 was now crumbling under the weight of desertions and mutinies. Hordes of men with rifles were wandering all over the surface of Russia. Even the Cossacks were unsure what to do. The Red Guards Vasily Chuikov, the son of the church secretary and the bare-knuckle fighter, found himself unemployed in Petrograd in 1917. But through one of his numerous brothers, he found something to occupy his time. He joined the Red Guards. In a few months' time, he would find himself no longer making spurs for cavalry officers, but shooting at them. The Red Guards had been refounded by Bolsheviks. They answered to the Soviet and not to any party. They were armed with weapons seized from the burning police stations or else donated by workers in the war industries. Soon there were units in every ward of the city, some formed on a factory by factory basis and patrolling on company time. For many factory owners, actually, the Red Guards were the only reliable security forces on hand to guard the factories. By July, there were 10,000 members in Petrograd. After the failed coup by the right-wing general Kornilov in August-September, the workers' army numbered 20,000 in 79 factories in St. Petersburg. By November, there were 200,000 nationally. This is a measure of the vast support which the revolution had. They had pistols, rifles, the odd machine gun, even a few armoured cars. On duty, many Red Guards wore their Sunday best. Their shirts, their ties, their waistcoats, watch chains, their fedoras, their straw hats, in which they used to promenade on a Sunday morning. Many soldiers and sailors, meanwhile, supported the Red Guards. Kronstadt, home of the Baltic Sea Fleet, was a rock-solid bastion of Bolshevik, anarchist and left SR sailors. But by autumn, anxiety had settled on the Red Guards. Winter was coming. The economic crisis was getting worse. Famine was already a reality. People began to think that maybe these Bolsheviks were just like all the others. All talk. Maybe the opportunity for revolution would pass. Maybe this movement would fall apart and there would be hell to pay. A defeat more bloody and total than that of 1905. But on the night of October 24th to 25th, the Petrograd Red Guards were called out onto the streets. The Provisional Government was attempting to shut down the Bolshevik newspaper. In response, the Military Revolutionary Committee of the Soviet went on a long-planned offensive. The Red Guards and their soldier and sailor allies occupied the capital city. There was no battle. The Provisional Government hunkered down in the Winter Palace as the Reds occupied the streets outside, just waited. The defenders of the Winter Palace consisted of cadets and the women's battalion. The latter was a unit of several hundred enthusiastic women volunteers for the war against Germany. To their frustration, they had been used for propaganda purposes and not sent into battle. Until now. At first, the cadets and women vowed to commit suicide sooner than surrender. But the hours wore them down, and confused and demoralised, they let the Red Guards in with a shrug of the shoulders. These children of serfs, who had lived three to a cellar, quote, broke into the palace and after rushing up the 117 staircases, through 1,786 doors and 1,057 rooms, at last, at 10 past two in the morning, entered the room where the ministers of the bourgeois provisional government were and arrested them. The Reds inflicted no fatalities. Apparently, they suffered six, two by friendly fire. The American journalist Louise Bryant was in Petrograd at the time, and she was curious about the women's battalion. Those she managed to speak to expressed 
regret that they had defended the Winter Palace and said that they had basically been tricked. But following up a rumour, she interviewed a casualty of that night, a young woman who was injured. And here it is in her own words as reported by Bryant, quote, Well, that night when the Bolsheviki took the Winter Palace and told us to go home, a few of us were very angry and we got into an argument. We were arguing with soldiers of the Pavlovsk Regiment. A very big soldier and I had a terrible fight. We screamed at each other and finally he got so mad that he pushed me and I fell out of the window. Then he ran downstairs and all the other soldiers ran downstairs. The big soldier cried like a baby because he had hurt me and he carried me all the way to the hospital and came to see me every day. End quote. This is not a particularly flattering portrait of the soldiers of the revolution, but it is a human portrait. The whole world, however, was told a very different story. Media and rumours reported that the women were raped en masse. As late as 1989, Western sources were still embellishing the original lie. We read in Anthony Livesey a book called The Great Battles of World War I, uh, published in 1989, quote, the Bolsheviks, who hated them for wanting to fight to the end, raped, mutilated and killed any who fell into their hands. End quote. The second part is so outrageously false that it almost feels silly to point out that the first part is wrong too. They didn't fight to the end. Uh, they were convinced to surrender. Uh, but the second part is so disgusting and outrageous that that point doesn't even occur to me uh, on first reading. After the revolution. Quote. Who will govern us then? demanded one daily newspaper which appeared on the day of the October Revolution. The cooks, perhaps, or maybe the fishermen, the stable boys, the chauffeurs, or perhaps the nursemaids will rush off to meetings of the Council of State between the diaper washing sessions. Who then? Where are the statesmen? Perhaps the mechanics will run the theatres, the plumbers foreign affairs, the carpenters the post office. Who will it be? End quote. As if in answer, the Congress of Soviets was meeting at the Smolny Institute. The vast majority of the delegates approved of the insurrection. The Mensheviks and SRs, who had once commanded a majority, were now reduced to a powerless rump. The Congress, without delay, passed decrees, taking Russia out of the war, transferring the noble and church estates to tens of millions of peasants, and declaring the right of self-determination for nationalities. The new regime did in a few days what the provisional government had dragged its feet on for nine months. They were able to do what the provisional government was not able to do because they were not afraid to power ahead and to risk the wrath of the vengeful ruling classes. In those days, Red Guards and sailors patrolling in the streets were harangued by well-dressed citizens who accused them of madness, anarchy, bloodthirsty violence, etc. The revolutionaries listened, sometimes puzzled, sometimes keenly interested, to their heated arguments and fabricated atrocity stories. Before the year was out, the revolution had spread to most cities and towns. What usually happened was the local Soviet would simply form a military revolutionary committee and take over. It was by no means plain sailing. There was street fighting in Moscow and Irkutsk, and there was a Cossack slash cadet rising in Petrograd. The Red Guards won in each case. But by the new year, a counter-revolutionary army of great dimensions had gathered by the Don River. It was one thing to rise up and defend your own city. It was quite another to travel a thousand kilometers to the very edge of Russia, to fight many thousands of officers, and to fight the Cossacks on their home turf. But there was nothing else for it. It was that, our risk, the revolution being crushed. The Red Guards took up arms and went south to the Don. In the next post, we will look at the White Guards and the Cossacks. We will look at why they took up arms against the revolution. Finally, we will look at what happened when Red and White met in South Russia at the start of 1918 in the first front of the Russian Civil War. Thanks for listening. On Lucht Seher Abu Slanlev. Yeah, but...